Did I mention I'm wearing gloves because I put my thumb through the table saw? Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to The Current Source. My name is Derek, and I hope you're all doing well amid this uh, coronavirus pandemic. But today, we're gonna make a quarter wavelength ground plane antenna using some brazing wire, some brass tubing, an SO239 connector, and some aluminum plate. So I live in an HOA, a homeowners associated controlled neighborhood. So I can't have antennas sitting outside. Um, so I'm kind of limited in what I can do. So a quarter wavelength antenna is obviously a quarter wavelength of the frequency that you're operating on. So it allows a nice compact antenna that I can stick up in my attic. Now I recently installed a panel up there with some uh, feed throughs. So we'll climb up there shortly and install a couple of these, but I made this one. This is the two meter version. And this design is everywhere on the web and it's been in publication in the uh, re amateur radio uh, circles for a number of years. Uh, but they always just show this aluminum panel with connectors coming off, but they don't show you how to fasten them. So I came up with a pretty decent way, I think. It uses a couple of clips and you form the metal into like a cup and it pushes down on the brass rod and holds it against the aluminum. If you have a, a loose connection, you can uh, change the angle of the radiator. And as we'll see, this is a way to uh, change the impedance of the antenna itself. Then when you really wang it down, um, they're pretty solid and they're held in place with uh, the friction that this thing provides. So I think it's a nice solution. Uh, you do have to have a, a method to bend the metal and I'll show you how I do it with the brake. Uh, but you could do it with the hammer and a vise. Now we're gonna test the range by using a repeater. So I'm gonna use my handheld radio here. And the rubber ducky antenna on this thing is not all that great. Um, of course, they serve their purpose, uh, but it's not going to be as effective as a real antenna like I just showed you. We're going to test this out by trying to hit several repeaters in the Orlando area. Um, if you don't know what a repeater is, it's basically a radio station that sits off somewhere. And it has a usually a pretty high performance antenna. Now, it can uh, receive your signal on a particular frequency and retransmit it using the same antenna on a slightly different frequency uh, with a higher power level and with, of course, the better antenna so you can reach a lot more people. And it's usually like, you know, several hundred feet to a thousand feet um, above average terrain. So you can really get a wider range uh, just by using a little thing like this. But I live kind of far away from these repeaters and I thought it'd be nice to make uh, a couple of antennas. Uh, the one I have here for two meters and another one for 70 centimeters, which is like the uh, 430 to megahertz band. Um, so that's what we're going to do today. So I've gone ahead and cut um, a small piece of aluminum that we're going to use as the base for our smaller antenna. And uh, I've uh, chamfered the corners off here. Uh, instead of doing the pinwheel configuration like I just showed you, uh, we're actually going to come off on the corners directly and the radials will come out like this. Uh, center conductor will be with the SO239 connector. Uh, so we'll drill a hole in the center, mount this thing, and then we'll use our little cup friction uh, holders for the radials. Uh, instead of cutting it out of mild steel like I did for that one, I'm going to make this out of uh, this strap that I got from the hardware store. It's um, K&S Precision Metals number 87167 if you want to play along at home. It's just a stainless steel strap and it is uh, 0 0.025. Uh, inch thickness. So I think that should suffice and I'll show you how I cut it and use the brake to form the roll to hold the uh, radial in place. Uh, so that's enough of that. So let's go ahead and get started on the calculations. Okay, so electrically uh, we're going to look at a dipole and a monopole. A uh, dipole is pretty much one of the simplest antennas that you can make. They're basically uh, just two conductors, right? Separated electrically at the center and you're feeding one side here with your transmission line, the other side with the other end of your transmission line, okay? Now, the free space impedance, that means if this antenna were out in space, it would be about 72 ohms, I believe, in free space. Uh, just as a contrast, our monopole is gonna be about 36, 35, something like that, of free space impedance. Now, as we bring those antennas closer to the ground, physical earth, that's going to change, okay, depending on the wavelength that you're driving it with. So it does have kind of an oscillation to the impedance value itself. So anytime you install an antenna, depending on the metallic objects around or how close you are to ground, you're still going to have to tune the length of this thing. 
Now, what determines our impedance? Well, the length uh, that you cut the antenna and the voltage and current distribution along that length, okay? So we have um, our current for a dipole is minimum, all right, at the endpoints of the antenna. It is at its maximum at the center feed point, all right? The voltage is maximal at the ends of the dipole and at a null in the center. So we've chopped off the bottom half and tossed it in the trash. And now we have this quarter wavelength section where a dipole, I should have mentioned this before, is a half wavelength. This is one quarter wavelength, okay, for the driven element. Driven element for, if you're driving it with a coaxial cable, is gonna be connected to your center conductor. And traditionally, this ground plane here is connected to your shield. So like we said, the free space impedance is 35 ohms. That's not going to work because our transmitter, uh, typically, especially for amateur radio, is operating at 50 ohms. Our transmission line, we'll call it TL, is also traditionally 50 ohms. Why did I do that? I don't know. Reverse umlauts. And our antenna, all right, we want it to also be at 50 ohms. And we do that to transfer the maximum amount of power from the transmitter through the transmission line to our antenna. Uh, if we left this at 35 ohms, as we send energy down here, okay, if there's a mismatch, uh, the power's not gonna be absorbed by the load and radiated out into space, okay? What's gonna happen is a portion of that is going to get reflected back, all right? And we measure that on, uh, I'll, I'll do it on the vector network analyzer, that is your return loss. We want our return loss to be a low value. So what we'll see is something, uh, we'll see something like this. So if we go, if we sweep the frequency uh, of the VNA, from, I don't know, 10 megahertz to 500 megahertz. We should see our dip somewhere around here because I'm gonna tune it for 432. So we'll get a lot of energy coming back out of band. And then when we get to 432 megahertz, if we tune this, cut the lengths of uh, wire correctly, uh, we should see minimal energy coming back. All right, and as we increase the frequency outside of the band we've cut it for, we should see energy coming back. Uh, we should see energy coming back to the transmitter as well. Now I need to make sure that my transmitter only operates within a certain bandwidth inside of this, where the return loss is the lowest. That means all the energy is getting out to the antenna, which is what we want. Okay, so I just realized as I'm editing this, I never explained how I calculated the length. So let me go ahead and do that real quick. Uh, so we're talking about a quarter wave ground plane antenna for the 70 centimeter band. Uh, that is 420 megahertz to 450 megahertz. Uh, if we want to be right in the middle of that, our, op our operating frequency needs to be 435, not 432 as I previously mentioned. All right, so that means if we take the speed of light, which is 299 blah, 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 blah meters per second, divided by our frequency in hertz, um, that gives us 0 0.689 meters. Now you can see why they call it the 70 centimeter band. And you don't have to be this precise. You're going to have to make adjustments afterwards. So you could just chop off these last six digits and say 300 divided by your frequency in megahertz would give you roughly the same thing. Um, I know there are going to be some people out there. You have to take it out to six decimal places. That's not true. There's going to be much more environmental influence in this than, you know, taking it out to 32 decimal places. It's just not necessary. Now we can see that uh, at one quarter wavelength, uh, we have to divide that number we just calculated by 4. That gives us 172 centimeters for our radiating element length, our center conductor length. The radials will calculate uh, in a second. They're a little bit different. RF travels at different speeds through different materials. Okay, Copper happens to be 95% the speed of light. That's going to change the length. It's going to shorten it a little bit. If we have a wire that has an insulation on it, or like coaxial cables, they have a dielectric and each different cable type has a different velocity factor. So uh, brass, I believe, is basically the same thing as copper. So we're going to take that 172 centimeters that we calculated before. We're going to multiply that by 95%. And that's going give to give us an actual real world length of 163.4 centimeters for our center conductor. Okay. Now our radials, okay, this is my antenna. Isn't he, ain't she a beaut? Our radials are going to be the same as this, this uh, radiating element here. 
multiplied by a 12% increase in length. Now that comes from the test book. I don't know if that's historically like found empirically or what, uh, but I'm gonna stick to the rules on this one and just say 12% plus what we already calculated um, added back to that is 183 centimeters. Now I'm gonna, uh, this is a tube, so on the top I'm gonna actually install a brass brazing rod that's a little smaller diameter and I'll solder it in place once we get it all tuned up. You don't have to fine tune it. Going straight off the calculations should be good enough to get you uh, a minimal return loss. Um, it should be perfectly acceptable to get you like an, an SWR of uh, 2.0 or less than that. Um, <clears throat> But I'm nitpicky, so I'm gonna tune this on a vector network analyzer when I'm done, and I'll show you the process. So for, for the dipole, we have a current distribution along its length, we have a voltage distribution. We don't have the same thing here. So the ground plane acts as a kind of uh, electrical mirror so that we make up the other part of that voltage distribution and that current distribution. Now this determines our impedance. Now I need to bring this impedance to 50 ohms, so what I can do is I can bend these radials down and we'll see on the VNA that it brings it from 35 to uh, 50 ohms. And in the text it always says bend them to 45 degrees. I found that my particular height above ground and my configuration with all the metal crap around me, I've got to bend this down to about 35 degrees. Okay, so we're going to design our system so that we can uh, loosen the screws and adjust them without actually bending on the things, okay? Okay, so now it's time to put on the center conductor. I'm gonna grab my fattest roll of solder. Solder, for those who don't like the way I say it. I understand the meaning is a little bit different in Europe, in the UK. My apologies. All right, we're gonna preload this. And what I'm gonna do is put a length of solder. I don't know why I have a really difficult time, a difficult time pronouncing that L. I'm gonna put this inside the tube so that when I flow the solder, it will melt to the center pin. And I've got my iron cranked up on max, and I'm gonna go ahead and put a little bit of flux getting uh, everything's falling off my bench. I'm having some allergy issues today. I do not have coronavirus as far as I know, but uh, you never can tell, can you? So let's load that back up in there now that we have some flux going on. I'm just gonna kind of leave it. Not actually on all the way. Let's heat up that center pin, get everything flowing. I'm going to push it down in there, applying heat to the brass tube. If I start to see it flow out of the bottom, and then I'm going to try to right it so that it's completely vertical, and let it cool off. There we go, that looks pretty good. It doesn't have to be exactly perfect, but the more vertical it is, the better off you're going to be.
And there we have it, our very own 70 centimeter quarter wavelength ground plane antenna. Let's stick it on a pole, okay, above my desk, and uh, we'll take some measurements. Or thought I'd describe an antenna as cute, but it looks like a little spaceship. How about that? All right, so here is the Nano VNA that I'm using to make these measurements right now. Sorry it's upside down, but it's got, everything's plugged in. Um, just when you're gonna buy one of those, watch out because there are a lot of fake Chinese ones out there. Okay. And uh, I'll probably do a separate video on this because it's a pretty cool little device and it's not a full blown VNA, uh, but uh, those are very, very expensive. All right, so I have calibrated out the coax, any connectors that I have in line, and I've uh, done an open, short, and load calibration at the antenna base without the antenna attached, of course. All this uh, crazy stuff you see on the screen here, the calibration offsets that are compensating for the uh, feed line. So let's go ahead and sweep it. So we're scanning, we're scanning from down here uh, 50 kilohertz all the way up to 900 megahertz. And let's put our marker on the screen and see where we are at. So we are 43 ohms and resonant at 441 megahertz, which is pretty good. So if I want to decrease my resonant frequency, I need to increase the length of the antenna. So I'm going to pull out that telescoping section. Hang on one second. All right, so I pull that telescoping section out a little bit. Let's scan it again. And you can see the frequencies decreased a little bit, down to 432. So I need to push the telescoping section in a tiny bit more, maybe another millimeter. Let's let's change the uh, bandwidth here. Let's start at uh, let's start at 250 megahertz, and we'll go to 550. So we're we're right in in the sweet spot where I want to be. So a little bit of fiddling and uh, we got right on the money. So I'm going to go ahead and screw this into the wall up there in the attic. And uh, I'll take another final measurement, do some tweaks that I'm not going to show on camera. So anyway, it looks like a successful build here. Check it out. Can I flip this around? So we got the antenna mounted here to a two by four using an RCA clamp. Okay, so just got a, uh, I got a hose clamp that's uh, squeezing the PVC tube. I cut some slits in it and uh, it's mounted up there. Coax is coming through the PVC. I'll put it through the feed throughs and uh, we'll test it out. All right, I got my HT over here connected to the SWR meter. SWR meter is connected to the antenna. So let's just uh, see what the SWR actually is. So we're getting uh, less than uh, 1.5 to one, which is pretty good. Uh, might do a little bit more pruning, but um, I'm going to call it quits. It's really hot up there. All right, uh, I'm connected directly to the antenna now, bypassing the SWR meter. And one of the stations, 444.075, I was only hitting an S2 on the meter. Um, I know you can't see it, but you're going to have to trust me. Um, so we're going to see if we can uh, get a better signal. So if, if when I hit the repeater, and it comes back, it should come back with the Morse code and uh, identify itself. So, all right, let's see if we can hit it. <clears throat> Victor X Ray Hotel testing. It beeped, and I got about an S7 uh, on that one. So, improved from an S2 to an S7. Um, that particular repeater is 17 miles away. So, let's try another one. Um, we had a. This is W0DQ. All right, let's go to 443.050. And I don't know where this one is, but I was hitting S7. We should peg an S9 by now with our better antenna. Victor X Ray Hotel testing. S9. All right, it works. So that wraps it up for today. Now you know how to make a quarter wave uh, ground plane antenna and the calculations and some of the theory behind it, not all of it, uh, because you know, this video has already gone on long enough. Whew. I hope somebody gets something out of this and uh, you know, subscribe because there's going to be more RF stuff, more general electronic stuff. And uh, it's been fun.
So stick a fork in me. Have a good one.